Hi friends, uh, once again, uh, welcome back to the Nurse Channel. So as far as all uh, nursing job aspirants are concerned, the year 2024 uh, is a fantastic year because a lot of opportunities are there for all nurses throughout India. And you know that very recently the Navodaya uh, notification also has come for the female candidates. And apart from that, we have the AIMS Norset examinations, then ESIC examination, DSSB examination, and there are a number of examinations yet to be announced. So this year here is uh, very crucial for you people and whoever wants to get a decent job in India, this is a great opportunity for you people. So keeping all these exams in mind, we have already started a series that you know very well that the AIMS Norset and the ESIC series, which will equip you to prepare well for the upcoming examinations. So this uh, series also contains 15 questions which are taken from various aspects of nursing subjects which can be asked for the upcoming examinations. And uh, like in the previous videos, I used to tell the explanations what I am going to give for the each questions are also very very important. So I request everyone to watch the video without skipping and uh, share about this platform to your nursing friends who wants a decent job in India with a very good salary. So straight away we'll move on to the videos. Before that, if you have not yet subscribed to our channel, kindly subscribe and support and kindly enable the bell button so that you will be notified whenever we are uploading new videos. So straight away without losing time, we will see the questions that the 15 questions in this new series of ESIC and AIMS Norset. So we will start with the first question in this series and the first question for you is from the vascular anatomy. So the question is smooth muscle and elastin filaments are found in which layer of blood vessels smooth muscles and elastin filaments are found in which layer of blood vessels so you know that uh, so there are several layers of blood vessels so in each layer what are things are there that we will be seeing in the explanation session first of all we will see the options option number a tunica intima option number b tunica media option number c tunica adventitia and option number d tunica lamina so in which layer you can find elastin fibers and smooth muscles so the answer is option number b that is tunica media okay so first of all we will see uh, what are the three layers of uh, blood vessels especially arteries and veins so the arteries and veins have three layers so the first one is the inner layer that is a tunica intima okay inner inner layer intima so it is the thinnest layer okay tunica intima is the thinnest layer it is a single layer of flat cells that is made up of simple squamous epithelium which is surrounded by a thin layer of subendothelial connective tissue interlaced with a number of circulatory arranged elastic bands which are called as the internal elastic lamina okay so i am explaining you the three things from this uh, uh, slide the first one is the tunica intima which is the thinnest innermost layer then the next point is the the, the tu uh, tunica intima is made up of flat cells that is a simple squamous epithelial cells and there is uh, elastic internal elastic lamina what is that it is surrounded by a thin layer of subendothelial connective tissue which is interlaced with a number of circulatory arranged elastic bands these are called as the internal elastic lamina okay so three points you are getting out of this slide then moving to the second layer okay so the middle layer is the tunica media middle media so it is the thickest layer in the arteries okay and it consists of circulatory arranged elastic fibers connective tissue polysaccharide substances the second and the third layer are separated by another thick elastic band which is known as the external elastic lamina already we have seen the internal uh, elastic lamina so this is the external elastic lamina that is a polysaccharide substance uh, sorry the the second and the third layer are separated by another thick elastic band that is the external elastic lamina so the tunica media may especially the arteries be rich in vascular smooth muscles which controls the caliber of the vessel so the tunica media is the thicker in the arteries rather than the veins okay it is thicker in arteries rather than in veins so this slide is full of points in exam point of view so the middle layer is tunica media this is the thickest layer it contains circulatory arranged elastic fibers connective tissues polysaccharide substances then it contains the tunica it contains the external elastic lamina then uh, it, this controls the caliber of the vessel and it is 
thicker in the arteries rather than the veins okay so that's all regarding the second point that is a tunica media and the final one is the outer layer of the blood vessels which is known as the tunica adventitia and it is the thick thickest layer in the veins okay so this is the thickest layer in the veins and it is entirely made up of connective tissue and it also contains nerves that supply the vessel as well as the nutrient capillaries otherwise known as vaso vasa vasorum in the larger blood vessels okay so tunica adventitia uh, it is entirely made up of connective tissue then it contains the nerve supplies okay so these are the points that you have to remember in exam point of view now uh, we will move on to the next question in the series that is the second session second question so intercalated discs are characteristics of which muscles so while talking about which muscle we you know regarding the intercalated disc intercalated so the options for you are option number a pulmonary option number b cardiac option number c detrusor and option number d diaphragm so intercalated discs are associated with which among the following muscles pulmonary related cardiac related detrusor diaphragm so what is the answer so the answer for this question is option number b that is a cardiac okay cardiac point cardiac muscles so the intercalated disc these are only found in the cardiac muscles and they form a zigzag interconnection between each cardiac muscle cell and these are observed to cut across the muscle fibers okay so they are specifically found at the ends of each cardiac muscle cells connecting them to the neighboring cells allowing the electrical impulses impulse conduction from cell to cell okay so this is regarding the intercalated disc which are associated with the cardiac muscles formed in a zigzag interconnection for the easy conduction of electrical impulses from cell to cell so that is intercalated disc okay so now we will see the third question in our series a simple tricky question average life of a taste bud is so what is the average life of a taste bud so the options are 10 days option number a option number b 10 months option number c 10 weeks and option number d 10 hours so what is the average life of a taste bud so the average life is is 10 days okay so the answer is 10 days so taste buds so the taste buds are clusters of taste receptor cells which are also known as gustatory cells okay so the taste receptors are located around the small structures known as papillae found on the upper surface of the tongue soft palate upper esophagus and the cheek and the epiglottis okay the cheek and the epiglottis so taste buds otherwise known as the gustatory cells are located around the small structures known as the papillae and where this can be seen in the upper surface of the tongue soft palate upper esophagus the cheek and the epiglottis so the, these structures are involving in detecting of five elements of taste perception that is the saltiness sourness bitterness sweetness and savoriness okay otherwise known as the umami okay and savoriness these are the five taste perceptions which can be detected by the taste buds of the gestatory cells okay so what is gestatory cell where it is located and what are the five elements of taste perception okay and the average lifespan of taste bud okay so this many points you are getting out of this question plus the taste bud cells undergo continual turnover even in the adulthood and their average lifespan has been estimated as approximately 10 days so this is the answer for the question i have asked okay now moving on to the fourth question in our series which cranial nerves should be assessed to check the patient's articulation language and other aspects of speech so the here the question is regarding the cranial nerve assessment so you have to assess the articulation language and other aspects of the speech so which all cranial nerves you should assess so that's the question important question so the options are option number one pro, uh, a cranial nerve 10 and 12 option number b 6 and 12 option number c 4 and 5 and option number d 9 and 12 so which are the cranial nerves you will assess for the speech related 
assessments, articulation, language, etc. So what is the answer? So answer is option number A, cranial nerve 10 and 12. Okay. So we know that cranial nerve 10, also known as the vagus nerve. So it's a play, it plays an important vital role in the speech control speech by controlling the muscles of the soft palate, pharynx and larynx. Okay, so the speech muscle control is by the vagus nerve in the soft palate, pharynx and the larynx. So the vagus nerve is responsible for the motor innervation. So these muscles are innervated by vagus nerve. So motor innervation of the muscles involved in the speech and swallowing. Okay, so along with that cranial nerve number 12, which is also known as the hypoglossal nerve, controls the muscles of the tongue which is essential for the articulation okay so together these nerves are crucial for the normal speech and swallowing functions okay so in this way there are so many other functions of these nerves that the hypoglossal and the vagus nerve that you can go through later but specifically we have asked about the speech production articulation and other aspects of the speech so the motor innervation through many of the areas for the speech production is by the vagus nerve and the hypoglossal towards the tongue and because of that, these two nerves are very, very important while assessing for the speech patterns or for the speech related things while doing the uh, cranial nerve assessment. Okay. So, the, in short, the other nerves also we will see what I have given in the options. So, cranial nerve 4 is a trochlear nerve. So, it controls mainly the eye movement. Okay. So, trochlear is related to the eye movement. Then the trigeminal nerve. So, it, the, it is a cranial nerve 5 which is primarily involved in the facial sensation and chewing not associated with the speech and the cranial nerve 9 that is a glossopharyngeal it is more involved in the taste and swallowing okay taste and swallowing so this is not directly involved with the speech production or the speech language articulation etc okay trochlear trigeminal glossopharyngeal these are the other nerves what i have given in the uh, this one options okay so that's all regarding the fourth question which is was an important question now we will see the fifth question in our series so while grading the folds of the pulsation in an artery which grade is generally considered as normal so this question is regarding a scoring system of the arterial pulsation okay so in arterial pulsation which value is considered as normal so that is a question in a simplified manner so the options are option number a plus two option number b plus one option number c plus three and option number d plus four so which is normal which grade is normal so the answer is option number a that is the plus two so we will, we will see for the grading system so the grading how we will grade for the uh, folds of pulsation so the folds of the pulsation in an artery is typically graded on a scale of 0 to 3 or 4 depending on the system which are using okay so i am explaining now uh, the one score and uh, before that we will see the answer first a grade of plus 2 it is generally considered to be normal reflecting a pulsation that is easily palpable of normal strength and expected amplitude okay so this is easily palpable normal strength and expected amplitude so like this pulse can be given a grade of plus two which is normal so what are the other grades that we will see in the next slide so plus one pulsation it is considered weak or diminished okay so plus one means it is weak or diminished and it might be more difficult to palpate and could indicate underlying vascular issues okay so there definitely there will be some underlying vascular issues so that there will be a weak or diminished pulsation can be felt okay and it will be very difficult to palpate also that is plus one so plus two already we have explained that is a normal pulsation and the plus three pulsation is considered increased or bounding okay so more than normal that is increased or bounding and it might indicate underlying conditions such as hypertension or other cardiovascular diseases okay hypertension or cardiovascular diseases that is hyper bounding okay increased that is plus 3 pulsation then what is a plus 4 pulsation so plus 4 if we are using this system then it would also be considered abnormally strong or abnormally bounding and could indicate underlying health concerns okay so more than plus 3 we can give a score of plus 4 if we are using based upon the hospital systems okay so plus 1 uh, is a considered weak or diminished plus 2 is a normal pulsation plus 3 is the increased or bounding and plus 4 is much more uh, increased uh, abnormally uh, increased bounding uh, which is known as a plus 4 pulsation okay so these are the standard accepted pulse force assessment grading system okay
so with that we will move on to the next question in our series which among the following is used to assess peripheral vision so from the ophthalmology so we know that there are two types of visions that's the central vision and the peripheral vision so peripheral vision can be assessed by which among the following tests so the options are option number a snell and chart option number b finger wiggle test option number c tomography and option number d amsler grid so among this which is the test to assess the peripheral vision so definitely the answer is option number b that is a finger wiggle test okay so what is a finger wiggle test so the patient is asked to gently occlude all the vision of one eye okay so one eye need to be closed for this examination with the palm of the patient hand and stare at the nose of the examiner so the patient has to stare at the nose of the examiner so the patient is then asked to count either one or two fingers the examiner is holding at right angles to the line of peripheral vision that nearly one to three feet okay so the finger exam uh, the fingers the examiner is holding at right angles to the lines of the peripheral vision that is one to three feet so this is how the finger wiggle test is done to assess the peripheral vision so all other options what i have given is for the central vision assessment so in that the first one was the snell, snell and chart it is an eye chart that can be used to measure the visual acuity okay so the visual acuity test is used to determine the smallest letters whether the patient can read on a standardized chart which is known as the Snellen chart or a card which is held 20 feet that means 6 meters away so this is a question another uh, uh, this is an answer for another question that can be asked in competitive examinations so what is the distance between the placement of Snellen chart and the patient for assessing the visual acuity that is 20 feet that is a 6 meters okay so that is Snellen chart then next comes the optical coherence tomography that is a COCT that is tomography so it is a non-invasive diagnostic technique that renders an in vivo cross-sectional view of the retina okay so that is a cross-sectional view of the retina can be assessed by this tomography so no need to go in depth about this day, uh, in this test because the peripheral knowledge will be uh, uh, will be sufficient for our competitive examinations then comes the Amsler grid so it is a simple square containing a grid pattern and a dot in the middle it can show problem spots in the field of vision okay so just to understand this for example for the glaucoma and all you can use this test okay for the diagnosis that is the Amsler grid okay so Amsler grid then the uh, Snell and chart and the other um, uh, test also the tomography also we have seen in the central vision assessment and the finger will test can be done for the peripheral vision assessment okay so that's all regarding a diagnostic test related to the ophthalmology moving on to the seventh question in our series which among these conditions can put the client at risk for developing hypokalemia so i'll be giving some conditions in the options you have to find out in which condition the patient can go to a state of hypokalemia so the options are option number A, burns, option number B, Addison's disease, option number C, nasogastric suction and option number D, hyperuricemia. And for your kind information that you can expect some a percentage of questions from the fluid and electrolyte imbalances and the conditions where these electrolyte imbalances can be seen. So these questions, these type of questions are very, very important in exam point of view, both for the ESIC and for the AIMS NOSET examinations. So coming to the answer for this question, so hypokalemia, patient can go to hypokalemia. Among these options, the option number C, that is nasogastric suction, can predispose the client to develop hypokalemia. How? That we will be explaining now. So upper GI losses, that is from the vomiting or from the nasogastric suctioning, are the free are frequently associated with hypokalemia okay so there will be what will happen is a patient with prolonged nasogastric suction will lose sodium potassium hydrogen and chloride ions so this imbalances may result in a deficiency of both sodium there will be hyponatremia hypokalemia and a fluid volume deficit which leads to metabolic alkalosis caused by the loss of hydrochloric acid okay so there will be loss of hydrochloric acid because there will be because of the frequent nasogastric suction okay so like that patients can go to these electrolyte imbalances then coming to the other options so client with the tissue damage tissue damage can happen in the options what i have given like 
severe burns, then hyperuricemia and Addison's disease. These patients are at risk for developing hyperkalemia, not hypokalemia. Okay, so the pathophysiology behind these things that you can refer later, like in the burns, there will be tissue destructions will be there, and then you, know, you can refer regarding the Addison's disease and hyperuricemia can how they can predispose to hypo hyperkalemia that we can refer it later. Okay, so moving on to the eighth question in our series. So, uh, again, another thing related to the liver anatomy, which among this is related to liver? Okay, so I'm giving some anatomical structures. You should find out which one is related to the liver. The first one, the option is option number A, Bowman's capsule. Option number B, internal capsule. Option number C, Gleason's capsule. And option number D, adipose capsule. So, which capsule is related to liver? So basic uh, first year question. So the answer is option number C that is a Gleason's capsule. So these all other options what I have given all these capsules are related to one or the other organs. So first of all we will see what is a Gleason's capsule. So Gleason's capsule it is the capsule of the liver. It is a layer of connective tissue, connective tissue surrounding the liver and enclosing the hepatic artery, the portal vein and bile ducts within the liver. Okay, so this is the covering for the connective tissue covering for the liver and it encloses these three structures like hepatic artery, then portal vein and bile duct within the liver. Okay, so that's all regarding the distance capsule. Then coming to the other capsules, what I have mentioned in the options. So the first one is the internal capsule. So internal capsule of the brain, I am discussing now. Internal capsule of the brain is a white matter structure which is situated in the inferomedial part of each cerebral hemisphere of the brain. So it is a white matter structure which is situated in the infero, inferior medial part of each cerebral hemispheres of the brain and what is the function of this internal capsule it carries information past the basal ganglia separating the caudate nucleus and the thalamus from the putamen and the globus pallidus okay so so the information uh, carries is the function of this and it will it is it pass the basal ganglia and it separates the caudate nucleus and the thalamus from the putamen and the globus pallidus okay so this is the internal capsule of the brain then coming to the important bowman's capsule okay so with the help of this picture you can we can understand it very well so bowman's capsule it is a part of the nephron okay basic unit of kidney that forms a cup like sac okay you can see a cup like sac that surround uh, surrounding the glomerulus okay so this is the glomerulus and it is a cup like sac so the bowman's capsule encloses a space which is called as the bowman space which represents the beginning of the urinary okay the beginning of the urinary space and this continuous with the proximal convoluted tubule of the nephron okay it is continuous with the proximal convoluted PCT of the nephron okay so that's all regarding the Bowman's capsule these are the some peripheral knowledges regarding these capsules so uh, for ESIC examinations and all you have to be thorough with the anatomy and physiology of all organs that is very very important so then what is an adipose capsule so the adipose capsule of the kidney so this is this also is associated with the kidney or the pedinephric fat or the pedirenal fat the other names is a structure between the renal fascia and the renal capsule okay so this is structure between the renal fascia and the renal capsule and each kidney is held in place by connective tissues called as the renal fascia and it is surrounded by a thick layer of adipose tissue called as the perirenal fat so we have explained here perirenal fat and the perinephric fat or the adipose capsule this is in little uh, a little more knowledge regarding the uh, adipose species capsule okay so from this cap uh, for sorry from this question we have come across some capsules which are related to the medical organs okay so that was an informative question moving on to the ninth question in our series from uh, obstetrics so the question is long intervals between the menses is termed as so long interval between the menstrual periods it is termed as dash long intervals so question you should be very you should read very carefully so the options are option number a amenorrhea option number b oligomenorrhea option number c menorrhagia then option number d metrorrhagia so what is if there is a long interval between the periods then what it is termed as slightly confusing but after finishing this question you will be thorough with these four terms so first of all we will see the answer for this question so the answer is option number b that is oligomenorrhea oligo oligomenorrhea so we know that if a woman 
uh, if a woman a woman reports the length of the menstrual cycle greater than 35 days or 4 to 9 menstrual cycles only in a year then it is termed as oligomenorrhea so how when we are calling a menstrual period is a, a menstruation is oligomenorrheic means if a woman reports that the length of her periods is greater than 35 days or if she is getting only a 4 to 9 menstrual cycles in a year then that condition can be given a term that is oligomenorrhea okay so what about the other options so we have learned what is oligomenorrhea then amenorrhea you know that am amenorrhea that is the absence absence of menstruation often defined as missing one or more menstrual periods okay so missing of one or more men men uh, menstrual periods that is amenorrhea then comes the another term that is a menorrhagia menorrhagia means heavy or prolonged vaginal bleeding with menstrual cycle okay heavy or prolonged vaginal bleeding that is the menorrhagia then comes the another important term that is the metrorrhagia so metrorrhagia it is an increased duration of the menstrual flow beyond seven days and continuous with the cycle okay so it will go beyond seven days and it will be continuous with the cycle so intermenstrual bleeding also occurs between the menses discontinuous with the cycle okay discontinuous with the cycle so that is metrorrhagia okay so uh, you know that well so oligoria oligomenorrhea already we have explained amenorrhea is a complete absence of menstruation over the missed periods then menorrhagia is the heavy or prolonged bleeding then metrorrhagia is the increased duration of the menstrual flow so beyond the seven days and continues within the period okay with the cycle okay so that is a metrorrhagia okay so i think you are clear with these terms now we can move on to the 10th question in our series so the question is a hormone called angiotensinogen is released by dash angiotensinogen angiotensinogen is released by dash so the options are option number a brain option number b liver option number c lungs and option number d kidney angiotensinogen is released by answer is option number b liver slightly confusing but you should thoroughly learn a system known as the ras that is a renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism so i am not going in depth into the explanatory session of this question so i'll be explaining regarding this angiotensin 1 and 2 so the other in detail if you want you, you please make a comment in the comment session so that i will include more questions from this session ras okay so first of all angiotensinogen what is an angiotensinogen angiotensinogen it is an alpha 2 globulin synthesized in the liver and it is a precursor for angiotensin okay so it is a precursor for angiotensin and it is a globulin which is synthesized in the liver so already we, uh, the answer for this question is discussed so little more uh, information regarding the angiotensinogen so we told that it is an uh, uh, angiotensinogen is a precursor for angiotensin so angiotensin means it is a peptide hormone that causes vasoconstriction and in and an increase in the blood pressure okay so it is part of the renin angiotensin system what already i have explained which regulates the blood pressure okay so angiotensin also stimulate the release of aldosterone from the adrenal cortex to produce to promote the sodium retention by the kidneys thereby increasing the bp okay so this angiotensin will stimulate the adrenal cortex to produce the aldosterone so this mechanism i think it is clear then one more point angiotensinogen is also known as the renin substrate okay renin substrate angiotensinogen the question what we have asked so it is cleaved by renin to result in angiotensin 1 okay so this angiotensin it will be uh, uh, cleaved by the renin to produce the angiotensin 1 which will later be modified to become angiotensin 2 by an enzyme known as the angiotensin converting enzyme primarily through the ACE within the lungs so another important organ again coming in the um, RAS system that is the lungs but it can be also present in the endothelial cells kidney epithelial cells and the brain okay so almost all the options what I have given has come to our answer but you should be very careful about this because uh, the ACE that's the angiotensin converting enzyme so this is produced primarily the ACE which can be re released from where from the lungs primarily but also traces can be seen in the endothelial cells kidney epithelial cells and in the brain okay so this is the uh, in short mechanism for the RAS so angiotensinogen 
uh, is a renin substrate that means the renin will uh, divide this angiotensin agent into angiotensin 1 which can be converted into angiotensin 2 by an enzyme known as the ACE that is the angiotensin converting enzyme okay. So, this angiotensin in, in turns will attack the sorry uh, will uh, stimulate the adrenal cortex to produce the aldosterone and then uh, causes the sodium retention and by regulating the BP. Okay, so moving on to the 11th question. So, I am once again I am informing you if you want further questions from the renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism, you please comment in your comment section. I will be explaining very thoroughly. Now, moving on to the 11th question in our series JVD that is a jugular venous distension can be seen in dash jugular venous distension so another important aspect uh, from where the questions can be asked so the options are option number a hemorrhagic stroke option number b left to ventricular failure option number c right to ventricular failure and option number d myocardial infarction so in which cases we can see the jugular venous distension jugular venous distension so it's an important part when you are preparing for the examination so the answer is option number c that is the right ventricular of the right heart failure okay so jugular venous distension neck vein distension is the result of what it's a result of elevated central venous pressure okay so this is the answer for another question this jugular distension is because of the increase in the central venous pressure which indicates a failure of the right side of the heart which uh, to pump giving rise to the venous congestion okay so the blood will be pooled in these veins and the central venous pressure will be increased and can be manifested as the jugular venous distension so in other options what will happen is in hemorrhagic options what will happen the neck veins are collapsed so there will not be any distension at all due to the volume depletion because hemorrhagic shock is happening then comes the left ventricular failure what will happen so it does not give rise to systemic venous congestion it can happen only with the right heart failure and in myocardial infection what will happen it may progress to heart failure but the myocardial infarction in itself there will not be any neck vein distension okay so these are the important points what we have to see okay so uh, distension can be jvd can be seen only in the right heart failure in left heart failure there will not be any distension in uh, hemorrhagic shock because of the fluid depletion there will not be there will be a venous collapse will be will happen and myocardial infection itself won't cause any jugular venous distension but later it can progress to the heart failure okay so that's all regard uh, regarding that important question now we will see the 12th 12th question in our series and the question is which among the following is a dietary risk factor for prostate cancer so from oncology so here the question is regarding the prostate cancer and the dietary risk factor okay there are so many risk factors but the dietary risk factor in the prostate cancer options are option number a alcohol and smoking option number b intake of vitamin d then option number c increased intake of fat and option number d increased intake of purine rich foods so which dietary factor is a risk factor for the development of prostate cancer so what is the answer answer for this question is option number c that is a fat okay fat fat is the answer for this question why so we will have an explanation regarding this question so the dietary factor which may play a role in the development of prostate cancer is the consumption of a high fat diet okay so high fat consumption can alter the cholesterol levels and steroid metabolism which may increase the risk of cancer okay so why this is a risk means it can alter the cholesterol levels and it can hamper the steroid metabolism so that's why it is a risk factor for the cancer development and dietary fat in particular high intake of animal and saturated fat may be associated with the prostate cancer risks okay so mainly high intake of animal fat and saturated fat are the causes so that is a dietary risk factor then other uh, options we will see that also is very very important a diet which is high in vitamin D is believed to decrease the risk of prostate cancer. Okay, so this is another important point that you are getting out of this question. So high intake of vitamin D is believed to decrease the chances of prostate cancer and vitamin D is protective against pro uh, prostate cancer since the vitamin D regulates the growth and differentiation of tumor cells okay so people who receive more sunlight exposure have a lesser chance or lesser incidence of and lower death rate from the prostate cancer these are the study findings so vitamin d also is important then 
next options i know i know that is the purine rich food can result in the formation of gout not related to the prostate cancer okay so moving on to the 13th question uh i said from the pharmacology a uh, very important question which drugs can alter the blood sugar levels so you are advising a patient to go for the blood test and uh, we have to take the history of the patient and while taking the history which drugs you should know that these drugs can alter the blood level values blood sugar level values so the options are option number a aspirin option number b corticosteroids option number c lithium and option number d all the above options which drugs can alter the blood sugar levels so the answer for this question is all the above the what all drugs i have mentioned here there are some more drugs that we can see now so there are certain drugs blood sugar levels can be affected by some drugs and prior to some glucose test these medicines should be temporarily given up or their dosages should be decreased and that such drugs as include drugs include first one is the salicylates example aspirin then comes the birth control pills then corticosteroids then tricyclic antidepressants lithium and diuretics okay so these are some of the drugs that can alter the blood sugar levels salicylates birth control pills corticosteroids tcas lithium and diuretics okay so another important question for you so from any of these areas can questions can be asked and along with that one anti epileptic drug that is phenytoin also can be added in this list okay phenytoin also so moving on to uh, the second last question in our series which of the following assessment the nurse should perform frequently for a patient in addisonian crisis okay so your patient is in addisonian crisis so which parameter you will be assessing frequently and why so that's the question so the options are option number a body weight option number b vital signs option number c urine for sugar and option number d neck vein distension so what you will be assessing for a patient in addisonian crisis so for answering this question definitely you should know what is an addisonian crisis that we can see before that we will see the answer for this question and the option is always vital that is vital vital signs vital signs okay so why vital signs is important in addisonian crisis so adrenal crisis also known as the addisonian crisis or acute adrenal insufficiency it is a serious life threatening complication of adrenal insufficiency so there will be hypotension or hypovolemic shock is the main symptom of adrenal crisis okay important point hypotension or hypovolemic shock and the other symptoms include there will be weakness anorexia anorexia nausea vomiting fever fatigue abnormal electrolytes and confusion and coma okay so the other features also you should learn so main thing is uh, because of the fluctuation in the bp and because, because of the high chances of getting hypovolemic shock the vital signs of the patients should be monitored very frequently for the patients in addisonian crisis so the patient in addisonian crisis develops circulatory collapse and shock so what the vital signs including the blood pressure should be assessed every 30 minutes to 4 hours interval depending upon the patient condition for the first 24 hours so this is a recommendation and the urine test for the sugar the other options i am explaining urine sugar testing for the sugar is not required as these patients develop hypoglycemia okay so question uh, the option was given urine for sugar testing urine uh, sugar can be seen in the urine during the hyperglycemic states but in addisonian crisis the patient can go to hypoglycemia okay so the neck vein distension so neck vein distension is also not expected as there is a circulatory collapse and show the before the, uh, there for there will not be any distended neck veins okay so these are the other why we have omitted the other options also i have explained so addisonian crisis and its features very very important now uh with that we are moving to the last last question very last question in the series from the respiratory system so the question is which is the definitive diagnostic test for pulmonary embolism so which is the definitive diagnostic test for the pulmonary embolism options are option number a ventilation perfusion scan option number b chest x ray option number c pulmonary angiogram option number c b ct scan so the question is very specific the definitive diagnostic test for pulmonary embolism easy question so the answer is option number c that is the pulmonary angiogram pulmonary angiogram so you know that pulmonary angiography so it is a medical fluoroscopic procedure 
used to visualize the pulmonary arteries and much less frequently the pulmonary veins. So, pulmonary angiogram primarily it is a medical fluoroscopic procedure to visualize the pul pulmonary arteries. Then, pulmonary angiogram is useful as the confirmation test where the non-invasive invasive imaging such as the CT pulmonary angiography is inconclusive on determining the presence of pulmonary embolism. So, so this is a confirmation test. That was that that's why the question was asked. So, where the other non-invasive measures could not uh, detect the presence of a pulmonary embolism, then this is the final test to be done. So, the accuracy of the pulmonary angiography may be higher than the clinical examination than the arterial blood gas results and the ventilation perfusion scan okay so we will see the other options also before that this pulmonary angiography is also used to confirm chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension that is a cteph chronic pulmonary embolic pulmonary hypertension thromboembolic and it provides a platform for the balloon pulmonary angioplasty to treat the disease so these are the other indications for the pulmonary angiography okay so that's all regarding the pulmonary angiography a short note for exam point of view then what is a ventilation perfusion scan so a ventilation perfusion lung scan also known as the v bar q lung scan or the ventilation perfusion scintigraphy it is a type of medical imaging technique using the scintigraphy and medical isotopes to evaluate the circulation of air and blood within a patient lungs in order to determine the ventilation perfusion ratio okay and the ventilation part of the test looks at the ability of the air to reach all parts of the lung while the perfusion part of the test evaluates how well the blood circulates within the lungs okay so that's why the, the two parts of the test that is the ventilation that te test for the ability of the air to reach all parts of the lung and the next one is the perfusion part that's the perfusion part which evaluates how well the blood circulates within the lungs okay so this is regarding the ventilation perfusion lung scan also known as the ventilation perfusion scintigraphy so with that uh, we are coming to the end of another very 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 important session so um, hope all these questions are very much useful for you for the upcoming examinations so kindly keep in touch with us and we will be coming back very shortly with another set of important questions and in between if you have uh, any clarification regarding any of these questions you are most welcome to ask your doubts through our comment sessions and any topics further any topics if you want any clarification you are very free to ask so with that we are signing out today so we will be seeing very shortly within very short time till that time bye